we now move on to the next sessions where we actually have um, Peter Woolcott, who will come back and actually talk to us about his view of the service um, and kind of the year ahead from the perspective as the Australian Public Service Commissioner. We're then going to have a panel session where we'll have um, Randall Brujo from the head of the Digital Transformation Agency, he'll join us on stage, and Rosemary Huxtable, who of course is the Secretary of the Department of Finance. And the Minister mentioned Rosemary a couple of times already, so she's in charge of all our dollars. Um, so Rosemary's going to join us on stage um, for the Q&A discussion as well. But I'd like to introduce Peter Woolcott. Um, he commenced as Australian Public Service Commissioner on the 9th of August 2018. He's got a, had a pretty distinguished career in the public service, serving as a senior diplomat right around the world. He's served as Australia's High Commissioner to New Zealand. He's been Ambassador to the Environment, Permanent Representative to the UN in Geneva, and Ambassador for Disarmament, Ambassador for People Smuggling, and the list goes on. So you can see that he's had a very distinguished career within the public service, and particularly in his roles that he's played within Department of, um, of um, Foreign Affairs and Trade. So most recently, um, he's also been the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's Chief of Staff. He was also appointed as an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2017. So Peter, um, I'm not going to keep reading your CV because I'm pretty sure you've all got it in front of you. But please everybody join me in welcoming Peter Wilcott to the stage. Okay, um, good morning and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to echo others in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I want to thank Minister Hunt for his time with us and his speech, setting out the government's high expectations of the Australian Public Service, but also his appreciation for the myriad of things we do to keep Australians safe and prosperous. What I will do today is focus in a sort of matter-of-fact way on the challenges facing the APS and on how we are looking to address them. But before I do so, I want to start with a few personal reflections on the summer we have had. Everyone in this room has probably been impacted one way or another, whether it be the devastating bushfires or the hailstorm that ripped through Canberra only a matter of weeks ago. And I know many of you and your families have suffered through this, and the coronavirus has added another challenge. But against this backdrop, the public service, that's you, have continued to deliver day in and day out for Australians. As difficult as this period has been, you have a great deal to be proud of, and you should not forget this as we go about our business. Often these stories are not told, but, but they matter. They matter to people filling out forms, connecting with government, or receiving government assistance. Let me give two brief examples which typify this. Services Australia employees reduced a 17-page disaster recovery payment page form to five pages, meaning Australians affected by the bushfires didn't need to fill out endless forms to receive payments. And health and DFAT employees are navigating one of the most complex geopolitical environments to evacuate Australians from Wuhan. And you talked about Minister Hunt's recent experience of this in Darwin. While all this was going on, you professionally delivered significant structural change to the APS with no disruption to services. And of course, Rosemary can take a, take a bow for that too, <laughs> along with many of you. Uh, services Australia, an agency that was directly impacted by these changes, continued to field over 120,000 calls from Australians that were experiencing devastation. It is a privilege to be part of a public service that constantly delivers what is asked of them and critical services that matter to the people. So, back to the focus of today's speech and to tackle what is next. I was in the Prime Minister's office, uh, as Mary mentioned, when the 30 review of the APS and its terms of reference were set up. Now, as the Public Service Commissioner, a fair swathe of the recommendations accepted by the government fall on the Commission and the Secretary's Board to implement. It's not always the case that you get to help reap what you help sow, and I regard it as something of an honour. So I'll talk a bit about the Australian Public Service Commission's approach to this challenge and what we hope to deliver for the service over the course of this year. Much of it is about cultural change, and that takes time and coordinated leadership. But it's also about structure, 
and how we acquire and develop our capability. What strikes me is the strong sense of confluence about what we need to do. We've been talking about it for some time now, and the 30 Review helped crank up the conversation to another level. As you know, David 30 was in his report to government last September. It proposed wide-scale changes to the APS to ensure it is fit for the future. These essentially focused on the need for more joined up, people facing, data enabled, capable and trusted public service, able to deliver efficient, effectively in a radically new operating context. The government agreed with the majority of the independent panel's 40 recommendations and asked the Secretary's Board, led by the Secretary of PMNC and supported by the APSC, to take these forward. This was to begin with a rapid planning phase, and this is underway. But the review was building on strong foundations. If you go back and look at Terry Moran's blueprint for reform in 2010, it is striking how the 30 review has built on this work. Moreover, you look at the work of the Secretary's Reform Committee under Rosemary Huxtable, and again you will see a rich vein of complementarity and the strong sense of direction for the reform agenda. Importantly, the Prime Minister outlined his guideposts for the public service in August last year, and so much of what the 30 Review outlines dovetails with the government's, thinkings, government's thinking. And let me say here, when I talk about these strong foundations, I include very much the service itself. The APS is well positioned to meet the challenges it is thrown. The experience we've had over summer has demonstrated that very clearly. The latest State of the Service report paints a picture of a public service that is fully engaged and committed to the task facing us. I know people enter the public service for different reasons, but essentially our culture has many strengths. Above all, it maintains an uncompromising emphasis on serving the government and the people of Australia with integrity. The fact that technology has made everything more immediate and connected does not change that. But what is different now is the sheer pace and scale of change. To take one aspect of this, the acceleration of technology. Predicting the future can be a fool's business, but you'd be equally unwise not to understand the trend lines, which are remarkable and have the potential to move from the linear to the exponential. Whether you look at Moore's law, which states that the processing power of a computer doubles every two years, or Kumi's law, where the energy efficiency of a computer battery doubles every 18 months, or Crider's law, where the amount of data storable in a given space will also double every 13 months, it is clear what is happening. Fifi Lee, head of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, said in non-technical language, we live in a mind-blowingly different world from our grandparents, and this will be all the more true for our children and grandchildren. As we grapple with these changes to society, the public service must also tackle increasingly complex policy problems and adapt to new priorities, including digital transformation, a growing demand for the rigorous evaluation of policies, security and privacy concerns, and a renewed focus on person-centred service delivery. The APS, like many institutions in Western democracies, is under challenge. Public expectations are high and trust in short supply. And these high expectations are echoed by Minister Hunt and by the Prime Minister. In his address to the service, the Prime Minister made clear the critical role the APS plays in the delivery of policies and services for the benefit of the Australian people. And the APS needs to position itself for the future, and part of that is working differently. We need to be less hierarchical and more team-based. We need to be less siloed and refashion our services around people and businesses rather than agencies. We need to work better across jurisdictions, and we need to be focused on outcomes and how best to utilise technology and develop our capability and leaders for the future. Another change is that the APS is working in a much more contested environment of influence. This is the way of the world. Good ideas and sound delivery approaches are not the monopoly of the public service. While we still have the authority that comes from the institution that is the APS, there is no room for complacency. Our advice has to be well argued and persuasive and open to challenge by political advisers, think tanks, lobby groups and NGOs. Similarly, the services we deliver ourselves need to be tested against credible alternatives. It is important to get our capabilities right, including the ability to influence our stakeholders. For it is the APS that brings the wider lens to any issues and ensures that the government has all the relevant data and analysis that it needs to make a decision. 
We also need to think about the interface between the APS ministers and their officers. When it works well, government works at its best. From my own experience, there's a strong need to improve and roll out better training and guidance for APS employees and ministerial staff in their respective roles and how they can work most effectively together to develop and implement the government's agenda and continue to deliver the very best for Australia. We should also be encouraging our best and brightest to work in ministerial offices to understand the different pressures and timeframes that ministers work under. So let me touch on how we're doing all this and what these reforms will mean for the service and for you as public servants. I'd like to begin by talking about the APS-wide workforce strategy that is under development. It is a crucial piece of work that will shape and inform many of our reform-related efforts. The strategy will take a, a holistic approach to APS workforce management and building critical capabilities and digital and data literacy. It will impact on a wide range of workforce domains, including recruitment, learning and development, leadership, performance management, retention and mobility. Through the APS workforce strategy, we'll be recognising that the capability of the APS workforce is developed and maintained by considering the entirety of the employment life cycle. Among other things, the workforce strategy will inform both a whole of APS learning and development strategy and an overarching professions model for the APS. A professions model provides a unifying framework across agencies that includes clear pathways for recruitment and career development along with opportunities for professional learning and networking. We launched a professional stream for human resources professionals with Jackie Curtis from the ATO appointed as the head of the HR profession. We started with strategic HR as a profession as we need strategic HR in order to get the other professions in the APS right. HR professionals across the APS will be key to the successful implementation of the workforce strategy. This year, you can expect to see the professions model expanded, starting with digital and then a separate data stream. These will play an important role in strengthening capability and specialist expertise. The APSC will also be working on an APS learning and development strategy, which will target the capabilities we need for the future, the reskilling we need for the future, and the leadership attributes we need for the future. Central to this will be the creation of a lifelong learning culture. The quality of the APS is derived, of course, from the capability and integrity of its people. So in thinking about how we develop our capability, there are a range of questions we need to answer. Focus on what should the APSC deliver, what is best done by agencies, and how best do we actually deliver it. Rather than being standalone activities under the strategy, learning and de development will link to performance and career management to build strong skills and capabilities. The APSC is partnering with, partnering with the Department of Education, Skills and Employment to develop a reskilling framework for the APS. The framework will establish a plan to help us to reskill our workforce in occupations of diminishing utility and ensure that employees can continue their APS careers in roles where there is increasing demand or in new and emerging areas. For example, preliminary modelling shows the APS would see a strong increase in demand for digital and data related skills including intelligence and policy analysts, as well as people skills. Through our reskilling framework and the L&D strategy, we'll support staff to transition into these roles. At the same time as we invest in capability, the government has asked us to do a comprehensive review of the APS classification structure to see if it remains fit for purpose in our changing environment. Again, I don't have any quick answers, but the questions we'll be asking are whether we are too hierarchical are there too many layers in the public service? And how do we build in the flexibilities to routinely and quickly reconfigure ourselves around a problem? The classification review has the potential to shape the service for years to come. And let me briefly turn to leadership. The APSC, supported by the Secretary's Board, will also complete benchmark capability assessments of all band threes in 2020, and will commence capability assessments for all band twos and ones. These assessments will help target development, guide career paths, and identify low capability. The APS leadership cohort has great strengths, and we benchmark very well against the private sector in managing complexity and in delivery. We do, however, have some work to do around ensuring our SES are innovative and that they make the effort to develop the people they supervise. And we also have some work to do in breaking down the 2013 in 
bedding down the 2013 changes to the Public Service Act, which emphasised the role of the SES in focusing on outcomes which are to the benefit of the wider system and not just their agency. The workforce strategy will also inform the development of a mobility framework for the APS. We know that mobility is important for the APS. It leads to diversity of thinking and the contestability of ideas and lifts the overall capability of the APS as well as that of the individual. At the same time, we need a balance. Too much or poorly targeted mobility can have an adverse impact and we can lose subject matter expertise. Deep expertise must be a core capability of the APS. The mobility challenge is not new and we have a better understanding now of some of the barriers. We also know those agencies like Treasury who are, who are active and effective in this area. From our, uh, from our employment data, we know that mobility rates between different ages, uh, between different agencies remain relatively low, but we have little data about moving internally inside agencies. We need to develop incentives, targets, and other practical measures to support mobility across the service and also in and out of different sectors. Such a system should have also have a more porous, should also have more porous boundaries and stronger connections with the private sector and state jurisdictions. And this again was mentioned by, by Minister Hunt. Another foundation for a capable APS is ensuring we have a workforce which is diverse in experience, thought, background, and heritage. It is important that the APS reflects the community we serve and is continually exposed to different ideas and approaches in delivering our services. APS-wide strategies supporting diversity in the areas of gender, disability, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment are currently being reviewed. We're also investigating options to improve our employment and retention of mature age workers. We know that the representation of mature age workers in the Australian labour force is increasing steadily as people choose to or have to work longer. As a large public sector employer, we need to be reflective of the population we serve, the Australian public, to be able to better understand our customers and deliver services. We will also work on building a contemporary employer brand and define and promote an employee value proposition that resonates with potential and current employees. This employee value proposition will form a key component of sourcing and retaining people with the required capability and specialist skills. Now, some of you might remember that between 2012 and 2016, the Australian Public Service Commission delivered a program of formal organisational capability reviews across more than 20 departments and agencies. Now we're building off what we learnt and restarting this program. We're going to use this process to identify agency strengths and challenges and then work out which ones are systemic across the service. The new round of capability reviews, which will start in 2021, will retain the previous focus on leadership, delivery and strategy and supplement it with aspects of the long-running New Zealand Performance Improvement Framework using a basis they term a four-year excellence horizon. So it'll be, it'll be forward-looking. And this four-year excellence horizon is used to describe the context in which the agency will operate in the medium term, the challenges it faces, and what it would look like if it succeeds. It provides a specific strategic focus for the agency's review and facilitates discussion with ministers and other stakeholders about the way that an agency needs to evolve to address challenges and to meet the government's expectations. Now, as I get towards the end, I want to return to integrity. I see this as key to our ability to serve the Australian public. Integrity is a driver of public trust. Our own integrity is something that we are able to control. As public servants, we have a responsibility to take a values-driven approach to our work. An uncompromising emphasis on serving with integrity has always set the APS apart and it is encouraging that findings from the 2019 APS Employee Census are broadly on a par or slightly improved from 2018 regarding integrity and ethics. We can, of course, always do better. We must therefore ensure that this focus continues. As outlined in the government response to the 30 review, the Commission will be working to enhance a pro-integrity culture within the APS and to reinforce integrity across all APS business areas and functions. One way we'll be looking to drive these practices is through integrity education and awareness. These are critical for staff at all levels and we'll be introducing mandatory APS-wide integrity training. This will not be a simple tick the box exercise. 
rather than be designed to build employees' understanding of integrity issues in their work environment. It will help to ensure that all APS employees are equipped to deal with a wide range of integrity-related situations. Let me say this is not about compliance. This is about giving you the practical tools you need to succeed in a complex environment. This focus on integrity will be woven into and reinforced by the development and delivery of a whole of service induction for new recruits into the APS. There will be a number of modules in this induction package, and we're already considering how best to ensure its accessibility, effectiveness, and uptake. Civil services in other countries, such as Singapore, successfully used app-based micro-learning for, for learning and development. And this is something that we'll take a strong look at here in Australia. Overall, APS reform will not be incremental. In order to succeed, we'll need to be flexible in how we implement the reform program, and change will need to happen in a wave, rather than sequentially lining up one project after another. Now, some of the more sceptical among you will point to the numerous reviews of the public service over the last 15 years and question whether this will be any different. You may be reminded of the advice by the prince in Lampedusa's The Leopard when he says, uh, change everything just a little so as to keep everything exactly the same, close quote. And it's true that the government and the public want from the APS a sense of continuity and stability. Services and functions still need to be delivered and advice still needs to be provided. That said, incremental change, old habits and patterns of work are not going to meet the expectations of the Australian public nor the government in helping provide the necessary statecraft in what are fast moving and quite turbulent times. So I believe it is different this time and different for a number of reasons. First, you have strong direction from the government with the PM's sharp focus on implementation and the Australian people. Second, you have an APS leadership that is committed to change and understands absolutely the importance of good governance and staying relevant. And finally, the speed of technological and societal change is creating its own momentum, which we must keep up with. My strong sense is that we have an unprecedented opportunity to shape the future of this great and enduring institution. The government has made clear its expectations of the APS. The 30 review has fleshed out the scope, direction and urgency of the change that is required. And the senior leadership of the APS, the Secretary's Board, is fully committed to leading reform. But even more importantly, the consistent message from the most recent State of the Service report is that APS employees at all levels are invested in and committed to the work of the APS. You understand the value and contribution you make to improving the lives of Australians and the future of Australia, and you want, and you want to do it well. We have a service that is up for the challenge. This is a core foundation for successful reform of the APS and to ensure its effectiveness now and into the future. The Secretary's Board can drive this change, but ultimately it'll only occur if we do this together. Thank you very much.